Well, have you ever been asked that question? What great thing do you know? I've had that question come to me in various forms. What do you believe? Why do you believe? Is this real? Why do you have hope? And I don't know about you, but whenever I receive those questions, I feel a lot of pressure to make sure that I have everything right. I mean, the weight of eternity is on those words. What if I say the wrong thing? What if I fumble through my response? Have you ever felt like that? Well, I think those feelings are normal, and I think to a degree they are, they are healthy. It, it communicates that we do take our, our faith seriously. We've, we've centered our lives around our faith, and we want others to experience this life in Christ not just for the sake of their life after death, but also for the sake of their life before death. C.S. Lewis has an incredible quote about, well, in England, petrol, but fuel. We are designed to run on the fuel of God's love. And anything less than that will leave us empty. So we must be prepared whenever we have someone ask us about our hope. Peter tells us as much in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. In the context of suffering, Peter says, But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet, do it with gentleness and respect. Always be prepared. Well, I hear a few things in light of what Peter has said, number one, we we can't back away from those conversations. When someone asks us about the hope that is within us, that's not the time to flee. That's not the time to look at our watch or pretend we have a phone call. It's time to engage. But also we need to be prepared. And that preparation, first and foremost, happens in prayer. Our defense of the hope flows out of a life of prayer and study We need to wrestle with these big questions in life. We need to think through our answers. But at the same time, I don't think we need to feel all of this pressure to make make sure we have the most eloquent way of saying things. I think it's good to work on that. But especially in areas that are outside of our expertise, uh, maybe faith related to science and philosophy, maybe we can't speak as eloquently as we would like and articulate the faith. And those are important questions. But I find that questions related to science, evidences, uh, creation, I often find that those are not really the real questions. In a conversation, when you peel back the layers, there are some other things going on. There are some real questions that lie below the surface. And I think we have to be in tune to those They go well beyond logic and reasoning. They lean more toward the experience of faith and a yearning for something that is is missing. A recognition of brokenness. Brokenness because of sin. Brokenness because of relationships. And I would encourage all of us to continue to think through these great questions because our role as the Spirit moves us, I think is different than... Maybe having all of 25 bullet points of evidences of God, I think the Spirit moves us to something more organic whenever we're talking with people. We certainly have a good conversation partner with us this morning in the Gospel of John. If you want to turn in your Bibles to John chapter 4, we're going to revisit the first part of the passage we read last week in verse 27 here in a moment. But we're going to close this series this morning, this short series on the sequence of events that happened there in John chapter 4 as Jesus talks to this woman at the well. Last week we looked at the theme of mission and the harvest and how what God is building, what God is working out in the night, we join in with in the morning. So last week we looked at the disciples who were caught up in the physical matters related to food and While they're concerned about the physical matters of food, Jesus is working on the Samaritans. The harvest is coming. 
And according to Jesus, the harvest has already started. But this morning, we're going to continue the theme of mission. And I believe we're going to find a word of grace for those who carry anxiety and fear about sharing the good news with our neighbors. So let's hear the word of God, beginning in verse 27 of John chapter 4. And then we'll skip a few verses. Just then, his disciples came back. This is following the conversation with Jesus and the woman at the well. But no one said, what do you seek? Or, why are you talking with her? So the woman left her water jar, abandoned her water jar, and went away into town and said to the people, Come, see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out of the town and were coming to him. Verse 39. Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them. And he stayed there three days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. May God bless the reading of His Word. So I'm going to channel Travis Walters here. He talked about the A-Team a few weeks ago. I grew up watching a show in the 1980s called Reading Rainbow. I like the A-Team as well. That's a little, little cooler, uh, Travis. Reading Rainbow, it was a a 30-minute program hosted by LeVar Burton. And he would read a a book during the show in a very dramatic way. And then he would do an investigative report related to the topic of that particular children's book. But as a kid, I always looked forward to the end of that show because at the end of the show, they would have kids my age do book reviews of children's books. And they would tell the the title and the author, and they would give a brief synopsis of the book. They wouldn't give away the ending. But there was a prompt at the end of every book review. Do you remember what that prompt was? But you don't have to take my word for it. And then music would happen. And then the next person, the next child would come and give their book review. And then it would end with, but you don't have to take my word for it. Well, that's a phrase of invitation when you think about it. Those kids were inviting other kids like me to read the books for themselves. Don't just go by my report. Read the book for yourself and see what you think about it. Hold that thought. When I read John chapter 4, especially the ending, when I read about the Samaritan woman, I see she's doing something similar there with her peers there in the city. I mean, here's a woman who was very confused about theology. And she thought worship was about location. Location, location, location. She was confused about some other things as well. Here is a woman who was probably not familiar with all the detailed arguments of the rabbis through the centuries on various topics related to Scripture. She had some information, probably the popular view of the Messiah. Here's a woman who would never be convincing in the areas of science and reason and logic. She wasn't a great apologist. And on top of that, she had a past. A very scandalous past. So scandalous that it's scandalous even by modern standards. She had five husbands. And the man she's living with right now is not her husband. Here's a woman who's walking through life aimlessly. Who would listen to her? Well, as we see in this passage, people did listen. She was convincing. And what was it that she said? What was her message? Well, it wasn't a three-point sermon. 
It wasn't a detailed walk through Scripture. No, it was a report. A short and powerful report. Come, see a man who told me everything that I ever did. See a man who told me everything about myself. Nothing fancy, just a report, a testimony, a witness. And what a story she had to tell. And yet even the way she tells it, it, it's laced with invitation. Notice how she begins that message to the people. Come, see. Well, we've, heard those story, we've heard those words before in the Gospel of John. Those are familiar words. Those are the words that Jesus uses in talking to his first disciples whenever they come to him and say, where are you staying? And he said, come and see. There's more being said there than, hey, come, come look at the house I'm staying. Come and see. Those are the words of Philip to Nathaniel whenever Philip goes to Nathaniel and says, we found Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth. And Nathaniel says, Nazareth? Can anything good come from Nazareth? And Philip says, come and see. Those are the invitation words of the Gospel of John. The Messiah of John's Gospel is all about whetting the appetite for more. The Messiah's mission in John's Gospel is invitational. And the Samaritan woman picks up on this. Come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. But she doesn't stop there. She continues with the question. Can this be the Christ? Already in her story, in her testimony, she is drawing the gaze away from her and placing the gaze of others upon the Christ. She's not pounding a pulpit. She's asking a question. And the Samaritans respond. In so doing, she's telling those villagers, I've read the book. I love the book. But you don't have to take my word for it. Read it for yourselves. Come and see. Well, they're drawn in by her testimony. They believe her. And then they come to the Messiah. And they spend a couple of days with him. And they read the book for themselves. And this is what they say in verse 42 to the woman. They said to the woman, It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves. And we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. The harvest is coming there in Samaria. Which brings us to the harvest that has arrived here in Austin, Texas in 2022. And we have the space this morning to think about our encounters with our neighbors. These encounters that really provide us the opportunity to build relationship. That's what we're doing in our home groups. This study, the art of neighboring. Thinking through what it means to be a good neighbor. Truth be told, there are so many things that happen in this world that are completely out of our control. We have knowledge of them. These events, but they're out of our control. What happened in Uvalde this last week is out of our hands, out of our control. But being a good neighbor, knowing the names of our neighbors, being hospitable toward our neighbors, well, that's very much in our control. And as we build relationships and as the Spirit moves among us, we will be asked, no doubt, what great thing we know. We'll have the opportunity to give a defense of the reason for the hope that is within us. And our reflexive response might be, well, I, I don't know enough. I can't really articulate the faith. You think about Moses and his excuse there at the burning bush. I, I can't do this. I, I don't have the answers. I'm not a preacher. Well, let me tell you something. Being a preacher can actually hinder those kinds of conversations. It happens to me. I'm still not used to it. When I'm introducing myself to someone new and we're having some small talk and they ask, what do you do? 
and I cringe. I think it's akin to, and we have a couple of dentists among us, but you know when you're, you're meeting somebody and you find out they're a dentist and you start to cover your teeth when you talk to them. <laughs> Maybe that's just me. I guess not. No, I, I see it. I see it in real time. Oh, you're a minister. Oh. And you see, you see them clamming up and thinking back, well, how many cuss words did I say in the last two minutes? As if I'm super Christian or something. Brothers and sisters, there is nothing more powerful than God working through you in your specific context, in your sphere of influence, in the relationships that you have built and nurtured in the faith and and the skills that you bring to the table by God's grace. And maybe you don't have all the answers, and maybe you don't know chapter and verse, but you have a story. What's your story? As we close this morning, I'm going to put a prompt up on the screen. It's the prompt for the week, and I want you to think about this if you haven't thought about it already. Because Jesus is Lord of my life, you fill in the blank. Think about that for a second. Because Jesus is Lord of my life, I'm less angry. I'm more generous. I'm more selfless. I'm a better husband, a better father, or a better mother, a better spouse. I'm a better single. My priorities are more clear. I'm headed somewhere. I have meaning. I have purpose. I have mission. I am not weighed down by the guilt of my sin. Because Jesus is Lord of my life. Fill in the blank. I would encourage you to talk about this today. Talk about this with your family, your friends. Talk about it at lunch. What is your testimony? What is your story? Everyone has a story to tell. That is our task. To whet the appetite of those who are searching for truth. To draw the gaze of others to the source of living water. I love this quote that I read earlier about The woman at the well, someone was writing about this, and this is what they said. They said, the Samaritan woman had become a witness. She had become a witness and proves that it is not the quality of the witness that ultimately matters, but the object of the witness. It's not the quality of the witness that matters, but rather the object of the witness, the one to whom We are pointing people toward. We are the redeemed people in the Lord Jesus Christ here at Brentwood Oaks. Our Lord Jesus crucified and risen. We have a story to tell. We've read the book. We love the book. But to our neighbors, you don't have to take our word for it. Come, read the book for yourself. Come and see. It is for the world that we sing Christ. Christ is our priority. Christ is our mission. And it is Christ who empowers us through His Spirit for this mission. If you'd like to answer the invitation to come and see, maybe to have the church walk alongside you in a struggle that we talked about in the intercessory prayer. Or maybe you would like to be baptized this morning or place membership with this worshiping body here at Brentwood Oaks. If you'd like to respond to the good news of Jesus, we invite you to come as we stand and as we sing. Christ for the world we see, the world we see.